Hey, what's up, everybody? The final session of the, the first semester. We are very honored to have Christopher uh, Robler with us. He's the head of the Digital uh, Timber Construction Group at the Augsburg University in, in Austria. And for a long time, uh, we have been following his work and uh, we really appreciate his way of approaching timber suction by using a little bit of robotics, not too much, in just the strictly necessary and how these can make very efficient and play with uh, structures and it is very very interesting how he's using like uh, recycling pieces in the, in the construction um, industry and for us it's it's a very good uh, hinge between first semester and second semester because second semester you are going to be uh, challenged to design a timber structure and actually like uh, you couldn't have like uh, couldn't have uh, any better lecture than that crystal so uh, thank you very much for coming. He accepted like very recently, so everything uh, was quite fast, but, but we're very happy. So we're going to do the lecture, then just a very short uh, coffee break, and then we do your reviews, okay? And then he'll run away back to your home. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Christopher. Thank you so much for the introduction, Enrique. Uh, I, I have to say, I've been following you as well, and uh, it, there's not so many people out there that uh, do these kinds of things, right? And clearly you, you are interested in this. This is why, why you're doing the masters here, I think. And um, yeah, I'm very impressed by your work. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, the output every year and what you do with the students. So yeah, I think it, it's very great to be here and uh, talk with uh, like-minded people that are also interested in lightweight structures and shell structures and robotics. So. Yeah, um, this is what I've been doing with uh, students and uh, researchers for the last few years. And um, as you see already, we don't want to just do it in theory. We want to build stuff because that, that's just so much more exciting. If you start building stuff, you have all of these problems. It's relatively easy to build a model in Rhino. But then if you want to turn something like this into reality, it gets really challenging, especially if you have not much money, especially if you have not much time. And at university, we never have much money. We never have much time. The semester is very short. The budget is very short. So it's, it's a good challenge because in reality, we also have to build faster. We have to build more efficient. We have to build more with less money and less resources, most of all. And so I think these, these lightweight structures and the challenge of building something with students in a semester is a good challenge. It's a really good challenge. It's a tough challenge, but it's a really good challenge. And the best thing here is this is what we do it all for. Look at the guys. Are they having a good day? Yeah, because we made it, right? We built a thing and it's... It's not so easy to get people excited uh, uh, in, in university <laughs> anymore. But if you build these kinds of things, everybody's excited. You, you want to get it finished. You want to build it. And uh, this is why, why we do it. And we now have a small team of uh, researchers and uh, teaching assistants. And um, we're growing. So. Right now, there's a lot of interesting things happening and hopefully we will be a bigger team soon. And um, it's quite interesting also at our university. We just recently got a lot of funding because the, the government put money into high tech uh, production. And um, we also have a completely new course. So actually, we have four different paths in architecture and they are of course, classic architecture, classic civil engineering, but also energy efficient design and digital building masters. And these are bachelor and master classes. So you can actually start with what you are interested in from the very beginning and then go very deep in your five years. And on top of that, we, we just um, also got um, the funding for a new technology research center where we will have robotics, where we will have uh, a timber joinery machine and uh, we will have a testing lab where we can actually test uh, a specimen so this is the plan it's supposed to open in november and uh, you see we get our own bundega machine to produce things and we have back there the, the testing area where you can put beams with 20 meter length for example for testing 
and then the robots are not in this plan, but this is supposed to happen. It's just getting delayed, delayed and delayed, and uh, eventually <laughs> it's going to be finished. And uh, then we can take students there and build hopefully really amazing structures. So just a little bit on the background where, where we are and you're all very welcome to come visit us or if you want to continue doing a PhD, then um, yeah, please uh, let us know. We might actually have some, some interesting collaborations with you since we are interested in the same things. But the, the next part of the talk would be what, what is really the challenge and I think for us, um, we have um, the challenge that we don't do mass production, right? Architecture is not mass production. We have to make individual designs for everything that we do. And that makes it so much more challenging. If you, if you make a robot code, robot program for the industry in mass production, it's relatively easy. You can put a team behind it. You optimize the robot code. It will run a million times. The problem is, when we program a robot, it will run one time, typically, with that code. One time. And that really means we have a big disadvantage, right? Any kind of industry out there that makes a product like cars or any industrial product like a mobile phone, they can really put much more time into the engineering. We have a lot less time, but same complexity. A building can become very complex today. So we have a small team and a very complex task. And so the only thing that we can do is really have the best possible technology that we can have. And um, as you probably all know, the way people are using the computer aided design today is still very much like using a drawing board. So even if you get the latest version of um, AutoCAD or you get ArchiCAD, um, Vectorworks, whatever they're called, this is what architects really like to use still, not even something like Revit, um, but really 2D drafting programs. And, and that is still very much um, out there in the offices. So what we instead do is, of course, um, which you probably all used already, parametric design tools, programming and it's so nice that we have now these intermediate tools like uh, the visual coding that we have with grasshopper with uh, generative components with autodesk dynamo or also programs like blender all of them have uh, visual programming interfaces and i'm not sure how many of you have already gone one step deeper to really um, write completely your own code complex programs, object-oriented programming. This is, of course, um, something that you can go very deep if you're interested. But then the next question would be, what do we do with this technology? So we have amazing technology um, and we also need to use some resources, right? And in Germany, we have actually much more forest than we are harvesting. So the forest is growing every year. There's more and more forest because it's not even being used. It's to a large part, not spruce wood, which we're currently mostly using for buildings, but there is a lot of wood. And you will see that a couple of research projects that we're working on are really specifically about using the wood that we are not using so much currently. And then we have, of course, um, amazing machines. Very close to us in Augsburg is the company Hundegger, these blue machines that you can see in a lot of places. I'm pretty sure you have one of these very close to Barcelona as well. They are everywhere. They are now in 70 countries. We've recently collaborated with people in um, Sao Paulo. There is a company that has a Hundegger machine. Very cool company, by the way. And um, then, of course, in, in all of North America, Australia, everywhere you will find these machines. So. That's why we also worked a lot uh, with uh, interfaces to use these machines, which is also quite interesting. And um, then the last thing is really that I'm personally a big fan of lightweight structures. And we have very nearby in Munich, uh, of course, by Otto, 
who has been building the Olympic Stadium in Munich, who has been building a lot of structures around Munich, around the place that I grew up. You maybe know how he was working with physical form finding processes, with these amazing models uh, where he was really doing things like we do now, but 40 years before us. And um, just as much, I'm of course a big fan of uh, the other Shell masters, uh, people like Pierluigi Nervi and uh, Felix Candela, we just very recently had um, the son of Edu, uh, the grandson of Eladio Dieste, Agustin Dieste. He was visiting us. He actually is interested now in doing a PhD and uh, basically following up in the, the shoes of his grandfather, who built these amazing structures in Montevideo, in Uruguay, and also some in Mexico and Brazil. Absolutely beautiful material saving lightweight structures. Yeah, so this is this is the inspiration. This is the kind of situation where we're at. And so the next part would be projects that we now really realized with this idea and with this technology. And the first project that I would like to show you is the one where I did my PhD thesis. It's the theater in Lausanne VD. And like most of these projects, um, it was funded through the local government here in Switzerland and um, we were using local resources to get that funding, local wood. And we also had support from amazing companies nearby like Bluma Lehmann and Schilliger Holz. So the, the basic idea of this project was folding. I'm sure it's a lightweight building principle that you all know. And uh, in particular, there was the work of Hani Buri before I came there. And he did the PhD just before me and built these very cool prototypes. I, I thought back then in 2010, that was really uh, interesting and, and interesting looking. But he did uh, connect these pieces with mitre joints and screws, which um, limited the structural performance. So the idea at this point was really how could we improve the connections? How could we make this stronger? And uh, there was a lot of ideas, but something particularly interesting was to make it double layered. And here you can see a little playful model, which was just laser cut. But the, the concept is basically, basically that your joints are interlocking through two layers. So it's like a double joint. And that gives you a very lightweight structure because it's hollow on the inside. And just Basically, one year later, we had the possibility to scale this up. So you saw it was uh, in the model very small, but now we wanted to make um, a pavilion for this theater, which was 500 square meter. And uh, the thickness of the roof was 30 centimeters. So we took uh, five centimeter wood plates and uh, 250 millimeter of insulation in between the two layers. And the code to, to generate all of these pieces, it was altogether less than one megabyte. That I still think is, is a, quite an interesting number because today when you see models in architecture, CAD models, data models, a data file for a Revit model, it is easily sometimes some gigabyte size. And um, it's sometimes a little bit hard to, to work with, right? If you have such huge models, which are kind of unstructured. And here it's quite the opposite. You have a highly structured model, which is code and parameters. And uh, if you want to see exactly how this was done, there is a paper um, where basically the entire process is very much in detail described how we set up the code all the way from design optimization assembly constraints all the way to fabrication. And assembly constraints is really a, re a big part of it because uh, it became clear to me, especially with this project, that you need to think a lot about the directions of joints, especially with these type of joints, which need one particular direction to be assembled. So that really um, is still, I think, a very interesting topic because you can basically interlock elements with one another and then you can reduce the amount of additional connectors that you need. 
And finally, the, we had never, we had no idea how this would look, especially with the joints protruding. They need to be a bit longer, so they can't, even if there's a little bit of um, imprecision, they would still safely connect. So they are basically five centimeter longer and you can see them. You can see even the thickness between the two layers. So it's very open. You can totally tell how the structure is working. It's not hidden, but um, it was a kind of unique look, a unique aesthetic also. And the same is uh, for the outside of the building. So there was really uh, no decoration. It's just the structure. It's simply tar board on top of it. But even with the cheapest roofing that you can imagine, it still looks kind of interesting, no? And uh, it's just due to the geometry. We needed to quite carefully look at the angles. So there's not, as you would imagine, any kind of uh, horizontal angles where the water could be standing. So everything is um, sloping, so the water runs off well. And it's also quite challenging with building physics um, that you don't get any humidity in between the two wood layers because that would be really dangerous. So we even have a monitoring system in there with copper wires that run along the wood and measure the electric conductivity of the wood. And then you can tell if it's getting wet and the moisture content. So it's if you do any kind of like more advanced wood structures, then it's not expensive to put in such a system and you can check the condition. They used to do that for bridges for a longer time and now it's more and more also in buildings. And then the nice thing is if you have this um, program and your grasshopper tools, then you can play around, right? You can try out other things like making formwork for concrete. I still think this was very cool because uh, you could really make um, relatively simple, relatively cheap formwork and you get quite interesting thin concrete structures. This one we made with uh, ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete with the uh, Ibeton Concrete Lab at EPFL. And we also experimented a bit with uh, robotic assembly where we mostly um, use the robot to really compress a joint which is larger than the joint hole and then the robot would basically press it in there and we used um, basically a big excenter motor like you have in the vibration alarm in your phone and we also tried um, a different tool that works like a sledgehammer with an electric impact so there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can still do in this direction to use a robot to assemble wood joints. The, the next project that followed up here is um, a workshop in Mantanach in Luxembourg and this is a 6,000 square meter building which actually got built. So these things uh, they started up pretty crazy and you think oh it's actually happening <laughs> because you know so many projects that you start they don't end up happening. Uh, it's like a one out of ten, <laughs> but then yeah, some of them they really go all the way and get built. And for this one here, the inspiration came from Dieste. I'm a huge fan of the buildings of Dieste, so it, it was really amazing that his uh, grandson is now working with us and visited us. This is actually uh, one of his um, roof structures in Brazil. And uh, it's just beautiful, no? So for the project that we did, we didn't really have a rectangular site. They mostly built um, a mold and then they used it again and again and again to make the same shell. And here we couldn't do that because the site has this trapezoid form. And then also they wanted to have um, three story height at the front and one story height at the back. So every shell is different. And then how do you do this? How do you make 23 different shells? The idea here was to, to use um, timber joints again. And actually this was, this was done with the, with the same code that we used before for the folding, because it's basically a Miura Ori fold. It just has no height, but, the, the reason why we did this is all about the joints. So you need to assemble these joints in parallel. 
And if you would have a rectangle with 90 degree corners, then your joints would have to be at a 45 degree angle. And a 45 degree angle is really bad for a joint because it will shear off. It's too steep. So actually, to get a, not a 45 degree joint, but a 22.5 degree joint, we came up with this shape. Because now you have a much lower angle for the joint rotation. That was the entire reason behind this shape. And uh, the entire building um, has this, this really strange look, uh, like a tire, basically, <laughs> um, because of the joints. It's just because of that. And what was also important is that the plate here, you know, wood is compressible in different directions. The compression modulus is very different. If you take like a, a CLT or LVL plate in, in the plate direction, you could squeeze it quite easily. But in the direction across the plate, where it takes the loads, it's much more strong. So to make this work as a shell, these joints, they need to touch the other plate directly. You cannot put a plate like this in between because it would squeeze the plate that is standing. So the joints need to basically touch through this plate and connect the plates with one another directly. And this is also the reason behind splitting the joints one, two, three, basically between, between these plates. Yeah, and then um, of course we started to make small prototypes. This was the very first one with 15 millimeter birch plywood. And um, obviously it's also quite uh, important that you get this curvature with flat panels. So you need to kind of um, distribute the error across the surface. But yeah, that worked pretty well and we, bought, we built um, a couple of prototypes. This one here we showed also at um, Advances in Architectural Geometry exhibition in 2016 in Zurich. And here on the day of the open door at EPFL where people were actually climbing on it and sitting on it. And it was a seven meter span with only 15 millimeter material thickness. So that's, um, I think, quite efficient. And yeah, the next model was uh, using the thickness of the full scale structure, which was four centimeter, but it was um, only half the scale of the shell. So it was a basically one to two scale prototype with the four centimeter thick plates out of the full scale structure. And here you can see the how we deal with the joint, there's always one element connecting with one element. So it's a little bit like a reciprocal node already, which is just making your joint a lot more simple and a lot more strong because connecting these pieces in one point, it typically doesn't work geometrically. And we also built our own uh, little BIM system, building information model, where basically every shell has a number and every box has a number and every plate has a number and then you can basically organize everything through names even in Rhino. So, And then if you program something, the program, it will find and edit your items organized by these names. And yeah, like I said, we were pretty surprised because this uh, client, they really said, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's start producing and um, the code that came out of this grasshopper, they, they just built it <laughs> and it actually worked. So there was two shells built as a demonstrator. And uh, that is not the actual workshop. So it's basically 23 plus two shells. And these two shells, they are um, a little bit to the side and they made a separate little building. But it's pretty cool that they didn't throw it away because it was mostly a test to test the stability, but then they didn't uh, demolish it, but they just put a little facade in it and use it as, a, as an additional space that they can use. It's a pretty crazy building, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, definitely worth visiting in Luxembourg if you come by in the town of Mantanach. So the, the next project is a lot smaller. And uh, like uh, 
it was already mentioned that uh, it's dealing with recycling because I think it's very important that we don't design amazing structures only, but we try to do it as efficiently as we can. And like I told you, also we have very little money at university typically. So here uh, the possibility was to use waste material, which we get for free. And where did we get that waste material? We got it from CLT production because this is very popular right now. And what do you do with these cutouts? You can't do much with it. It's really difficult to make um, another wall out of it. If you have these little flat pieces, you try to make a ceiling out of it. It can't really take traction because making a joint that can take tension is very difficult. You need to spend a lot of money to make that joint work. The only thing that you can do is that you make a compressive structure because in a compressive structure, the joints can be relatively simple because things are mostly under compression. You will have under certain circumstances a little bit of out of plane forces and bending, but only a little bit. So this could be much more realistic to put a structure back together out of small parts. And yeah, you know the trick right uh, here. Antoni Gaudi, Sagrada Familia, who would know better uh, how this stuff works. So the next question was geometry. How do we tile it? Uh, what kind of shape? Triangles, quadrilaterals, hexagons. And it's quite interesting because there's a lot of questions like how many, um, how many cuts do you have to make? Is it more with this, with this, with that? Uh, it, there are really advantages and disadvantages of every one of these shapes, but maybe one of the most interesting ones is the bottom row here. You can um, basically fix this offset problem by making a cutout because you can't make a perfect offset of these shapes. With one exception, if you have only three edges connecting in one point, then you can get a so-called exact face offset. Um, there's a couple of different names. Some say it's a constant distance offset or exact face offset. It's two terms that they're using, but it's quite important for a lot of reasons. Stability, fireproofing is quite critical. If you have any kind of situations like this, this will be very difficult with fireproofing because if um, the fire attacks from the bottom, then you get the hole, the air can go through, the fire can go through. Very problematic. So just for that. And um, generally you want geometrically the best possible model that you can get. So this is interesting, right? But everybody who has been working with uh, hexagonal planar structures, it's not easy. It's very challenging. Um, so yeah, it um, it really takes a bit of understanding how it works and it has a lot to do basically with surface curvature. So you can see here on the left side that you need to design a pattern that will be oriented correctly with your curvature directions. So there's basically for every point on a shell, there is a minimum and maximum curvature. So you can basically take a point and project a line onto the surface and it will become a curve and the curve has a radius. And then if you go around in a circle, you can have a minimum and a maximum radius. And this is the directions that you're looking for. And these are the directions that your pattern needs to follow. And then you can basically um, use the duality of meshes to get from um, triangular meshes to hexagonal meshes. And only, only if you design it the right way, you can planarize it. So planarizing is not even the big problem. The problem is topology. You need to design the correct topology and then it's relatively easy to planarize. But the problem is really to get the right topology. And um, yeah, then of course you need to connect it and uh, <sighs> Back then I met uh, Sepp Schilcher, a good friend of mine, and uh, he developed this um, X-shaped connector. 
which I thought was really perfect for this because if you have such a flat connection, it's really difficult to do with screws. But um, with these types of connectors, it's relatively easy to do. And we managed to make the first shell, which was completely out of timber. There's no metal, no screw, no metal connector in this entire shell. And uh, that was um, unique at this time. And you don't even see it because you don't have to cut all the way through. And yeah, you see the, the quality is super nice, right? Uh, so we, we quite often, we work with uh, partners. So we didn't produce this ourselves, but we work together with a company and these guys, they, they know how to operate their machine. So we did actually even put the chamfer of one millimeter with 45 degrees. And um, the, the lowest layer of this plate is a special high quality wood so you could use it like an interior finish. And this video, you see how the first prototype was put together. It's like Lego, basically. We did put some glue also, just because this was transported um, to a lot of different places. And uh, normally you don't have to put glue. It's enough uh, to really push these wedge-shaped connectors in because with the wedge they extend to the side and then they're really very firmly connected normally. And yeah, we made a, an algorithm in Rhino to create these 3D pieces. You can see also that there's not only these X6 connectors, but we also needed to use um, beech wood dowels for the out-of-plane um, possible out of plane forces, this wouldn't really have been necessary. But our engineers, they were also very nervous, so we need to put a bit more connectors in. <laughs> but it's still, it's only wood. And the interesting thing is this model here, it was just to look at. It was not really good for anything because this model, what do I do with it? I can't give it a company and say, produce this. They would say, okay. <laughs> Every part is different. Um, I'm not going to sit down and, and make a CNC code for every single part. It was not even a big structure, but it was 230 parts. Um, we actually only pre-drilled one half. And then on site, they take a drill and they drill a little bit into the other shell. So you have the perfect alignment. I'm not even sure if this was really necessary. We could have probably pre-drilled both sides, but um, um, the idea was basically that if you would have a little bit of misalignment, I don't think it would have been necessary because this connector here, it already gives you perfect alignment. But in some cases, like imagine we would not have this one, then it would make a lot of sense because then um, if your holes don't perfectly align, this connector, it will pull in place. If it's um, misaligned by two millimeter, it will correct. But this here not. So if it's misaligned, then you have a problem. How are you going to get this in the right place? Um, maybe with some diagonal screws that you put in, but it's gonna be nasty. But really the, the most important thing was developing um, export function to send this directly to the Hundegger machine. So yeah, we did uh, write some, some code so you can export it. You also see that there's a one millimeter gap between these elements. That's also quite important that um, we are putting a little gap everywhere. So in reality, everything is a little bit smaller than it should be. If it's the other way, if it's a little bit larger than it should be, you can't put it together. So these are the little tricks that can make your life very painful if, if you build this and it doesn't fit together and you have a huge nightmare in front of you. Which, of course, we had with models, but uh, you should try that with small models before you build a big thing and uh, produce 250 elements that don't fit. But otherwise, this is, um, is of course, really nice because in, in this software, you really uh, don't need to do much because the software will automatically suggest how you can fabricate this. So you export the file and then this software will automatically suggest how to fabricate it. And then you can change things. You can say, okay, no, I don't want to use this tool because I want to use a better tool, but it will automatically make a suggestion. 
and you don't really have to code anything or make uh, uh, with a visual interface any kind of machining code. It's very automatic and uh, yeah, that's important if you have 250 parts you can't do it by hand. It would take forever. Yeah, and we'll generate this timeline of um, how the machine works, what kind of um, motor it uses, and um, how it grips elements. Yeah, and here we started putting it together. It's, yeah. You see the little wood dowels and the X6 connectors. And yeah, from the inside, it looks really nice. Right? You see no cutouts, and this um, computer generated pattern is also kind of nice to look at, I think. And here you see how thin it is, right? It's uh, 10 centimeter, but for a span of 12 meter, it's uh, quite a thin shell. And it's still there. So we did um, put a roof on it. You see here we have this uh, zinc uh, treated metal cladding, which is overlapping in little pieces. And uh, it, it turns out that the cheapest roof to put on this was a green roof. And I really liked the idea. It was a bit challenging because um, in the steeper parts, you need to use uh, a special system. It's basically cable net that goes on top of it. And then this cable net is holding your substrate for the grass. It's quite easy at the top where it's flat, but the more steep it gets, you need to use a different system to hold the soil in place. But I think we should have more shells with green roofs on them, right? It's even useful to have the weight. So it's a structure that is too lightweight for the wind mostly and it was pretty much beneficial for the structure to put some weight on it. So the next project I already said that um, I think we need to use different types of wood because in, in Germany we don't really have the, the coniferous wood that you see in buildings mostly. So if you look in any kind of wood buildings today, it's spruce, fir, something like um, coniferous wood species. And they don't really grow here. They don't really grow in Spain, I think, and they don't really grow in Germany. So we here, we have more leafed trees and um, they are more difficult to work with because they don't grow that straight and they're a little bit more challenging but uh, this is why we really work together with uh, the forestry department of our state and they were really pointing us at so many interesting things they said look the, the spruce wood here it has no chance in a hundred years it's all gone due to climate change and the only trees that we will have is basically beech and oak but they're already not so not so healthy anymore and I have to say, I just saw on the way here that here is also a big problem, right, with the, with the drought. And um, so what you need is trees that can deal with the drought. And the best tree, basically, for this problem is the Castanea sativa. It's the sweet chestnut. You probably know from the fruit that you can eat. And um, is it? Okay. They are really, for, for a warm, dry climate, a fantastic tree. And they are absolutely great building material, highly resistive to um, decay, um, to mold, to, to any kind of um, humidity problems. It's a fantastic wood. It has a very high density. The only problem is basically it doesn't grow very straight. It grows faster than oak, actually. It has very similar pro properties than oak, but it is faster growing. And um, on the next slide, I will also show how, how well it can deal with, uh, with the drought. So in, in Germany, this tree didn't really exist a couple of decades ago because um, it's not really for this climate. But now with climate change, it is uh, basically an invasive species. It's coming from more like Mediterranean countries. Uh, I think Italy, France, Greece have a large population of this tree have always had 
and uh, in Germany now it it is spreading in the warmest regions of Germany, the Rhine Valley. And here um, the forestry departments were basically treating it as an invasive species, but it's a very interesting wood. And so right now there's a lot of interesting research. Look at the papers um, for this type of tree, which is just, um, as you see on the left side here, much more drought resistant than our two main trees that we have in Germany, the oak and beech. And it especially can help if a forest is not so healthy anymore and you get any uh, um, dead trees, dead areas in the forest, then you can fill them with this tree and it will protect the entire forest because it's, uh, it's like a cavity in the forest and it gets very hot then and it will um, increase damaging the trees around it. So, but it doesn't grow very straight. And so we, we thought of Solinger who was working with short wood pieces and he was building larger roofs from very simple, cheap material, thin and short wood pieces. And then the second problem is of course that um, metal connectors will corrode on this wood. So you can't use a normal metal connector. So instead you have to use either a very expensive um, stainless steel connectors or you do it with wood joints and we found that an interesting challenge so program the little uh, rhino tool where you can select the surface and then on that surface you can generate connections and also export fabrication data and uh, it was kind of fun to to uh, code these joints. Again, it's not really useful for anything other than looking at because if you export it for the machine, the machine wants only parameters. What is the joint position? What is the angle here and so on? It doesn't care about geometry. It cares only about parameters. But if you want to see it in Rhino, you want to make this nice model, then, then you really have to um, program also the, the geometry of the connection. And you can see the angle. If you have two neighboring pieces and you want to insert a piece from above, then you need your joint to be at an angle that allows for inserting it. So if your angle is 10 degrees, then your joint angle needs to be also 10 degrees. If it's less, it won't go in. So for every piece, if you have a curvature, you need to make sure that the joint angle is as large as the angle between two neighboring elements. But you can automate it and the machine doesn't care if the joint angle is 10, 12, 15, whatever. But um, this is really uh, quite important because otherwise it won't go in. You can't connect it. Yeah, and then you can again uh, quite nicely export it to this fabrication software. and it will even do uh, nesting. So you can tell the software what is your raw piece size and then you can also do a simulation of the production process. That's very cool. If you have that software on your computer, you can just try out how long does it take because that will be your price <laughs> material and how long it will take to produce it. And how much waste do you generate? Very big part of the cost. If, if you have a lot of cut-off material, you will have to pay for it. And this was the first test. Here it's not the chestnut wood, it's simple spruce wood for the first test. But uh, the next image you will see the real wood. But it's still interesting, I think, to see the machine has uh, on one spindle, multiple tools, so you can s swap it around and uh, don't have to tool change like you would do sometimes with a robot. It's quite efficient. And yeah, these are the parts. So every part is different, obviously, <laughs> and you need to you need to puzzle it together. But then it's quite satisfying, right? If you put it together and you get the shape, it's kind of cool. It's really a shame we used it only this one time, but you could make all kinds of shapes with it. Uh, it's just we didn't really have a 
another use for it in the meantime. But yeah, we made a floor out of the sweet chestnut wood and the roof cover is also sweet chestnut. So this entire thing is completely out of sweet chestnut and it's located at the sweet chestnut hiking trail in uh, Anweiler distant town. Um, so the forestry department, they do tours with tourists and they always take them there and show them the building. So anything that you've seen is permanent. All of these structures, they stayed there in a permanent place. So yeah, one more, the Hexbox canopy that um, I did together with my good old friend Eduardo. We studied together in London and he's now at the University of Sydney. And we, we took our two classes of students and said, let's build something. Um, let's do something with uh, physical form finding. And let's visit Eduardo. Let's take a field trip to, to Sydney and um, let's build something at their building. They allowed us to build on their terrace. So this is a building in the middle of Sydney and uh, they allowed us on this balcony to put a structure for one year. And we had this robot. So one week of time, robot and this uh, outdoor space on the balcony. And the students, they were really inspired by the Recycle shell project with the wood joints, with the wedge joints. So they designed something very similar. And these were the first tests where we were experimenting with um, small modules. If you build as a team of students, you don't have a crane. Things need to be super lightweight. Modules need to be relatively small. So yeah, we needed to make it uh, hollow. And again, due to the geometry here, you have no chance with quads or triangles because you can't really fix this error with such thin panels. You need to make it with an exact phase offset. And again, this is uh, quite challenging. But um, you know probably this phenomenon that if you go on anti-clastic curvature, then it gets this bow tie shape. And uh, yeah, we even found it kind of interesting to make a wave which goes from the positive to the negative curvature and it will reflect in this in this pattern and um, at the same time we needed to figure out how do we put these boxes together precisely because if you don't do it precisely it won't fit together <laughs> if if you make errors then it will not become a roof uh, the error will get more and more and more and it won't work so we had to come up with a couple of ideas how to really make sure that things are precise and this wedge joint here is also quite important because it can, like a screw, it can pull together. If something is not in the perfect position, then this joint, you can hammer it in and it will pull together your boxes. Super important. So, I think actually that um, the master student who worked on this project, he did uh, go to Spain, Enrico Valentino, um, but he's working with a different research group, I think. Italian guy, very talented. Um, so a master's student here was, I showed you the list of students in the beginning, it was a big group from the two universities and uh, a master's student also, he did his thesis helping with um, fabrication. And this was the most important model that we made before we, we went to Sydney. So we made this one in Germany and we needed to make three rows to see if it fits, if you get an error. Because if your geometry is not perfect, if you don't make it a little bit undersized, so again, we have one millimeter gap, you have the risk that the error is getting more and more and more. And then you can't put it together. So it's like bricks, but you have no mortar. So you need 100% precision Otherwise, you can't put it together. But it is possible. If you program your machine correctly, if you calibrate the machine directly, uh, correctly, then um, you can put it together. It's absolutely possible. But we needed to calibrate the robot there. If you see any robot in any workshop, it will not be calibrated. 
you look away one second, it's not calibrated anymore. <laughs> so you need to go and you need to calibrate it. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, it's, it's going to fit together. <laughs> so we made it in five days. And again, it was really a satisfying result um, and a quite unique look with these uh, wood connectors. The entire shell made completely out of wood and really every student was making a box basically. So everybody was participating and nobody wanted to be the guy who made this bad box that didn't go in. <laughs> so one more, the basically last one that we worked on for the last two years is um, more and more, you see, we started with this uh, CLT and now we go more and more to um, a space frame, to a more material saving, lightweight structure. So a big inspiration were these grid uh, structures out of wood. You know this one here? It's uh, the Canary Wharf in London from Norman Foster. And it does not work geometrically fully. So this is why the joints here, they need to fix the error between the elements because this is not a shape that gets you an exact, exact face offset. It doesn't work. So, but you can fix it. Um, the problem is it would be very expensive to fix it because you have to make all of these uh, special metal nodes and uh, that can be very painful. Same story here for the amazing uh, domes by Rubner in, in Italy that they built uh, the Federico Brindisi 1 and 2. Huge shell. Um, and it really shows that this makes a lot of sense if you want to make a big lightweight structure. This is the perfect geometry. But again, they need to fix the error at the joint because it is not an exact phase offset. So the idea that we had was really that we, for the exact phase offset, we used the um, trivalent polygonal mesh. And then for the cross bracing, because a quad or a, a hexagon, it will not have cross bracing. So we need to put a cross bracing. And this is again, not so easy because you need to make sure that the cross bracing is geometrically working. So the only possibility, you can't connect them in one point because they will all be rotated differently, you know? So if they all have different rotations, you need to pull apart this central node. And if one needs one, it doesn't matter how they are rotated, but you can't connect them all together. So it's all um, very pragmatic reasoning behind this shape. And finally, this is very simple. This is extremely simple to build. It's extremely cheap to build. And the first prototype that we did, we used uh, this robot. We did a workshop together with um, my friend Jonas Lundberg at uh, Chalmers University in Sweden. And they had this robot standing around. We did buy on eBay uh, this motor for 1,500 euro. It's a very, very cheap air-cooled motor with uh, 9 kilowatt power. And then we put a saw blade on it, which is the most simple tool and the most cheap tool also. And then uh, yeah, we produced all of the parts in one day with this very simple uh, jig that we made, which wasn't even that uh, professional, but um, precision was good. And with one day of fabrication and one day of assembly, we could make this, this shell. And you see, we can, we can give it any depth because there's no error. So we can make very tall beams, very thin, tall beams, which work very well structurally. So getting this perfect geometry allows you to make a very lightweight and very high beams. So here you see uh, one of the students hanging uh, at the top of it. And everybody was really impressed about the, the stiffness of this shell. It was very simple, but also very strong. And um, yeah, we, we really realized we need to build a, a larger one because it has really, it's a good structure. It has very much potential to be much bigger and it's super cheap. It has no metal joint. It's connected with a couple of really cheap connectors that you can buy at any DIY market. Extremely cheap structure. So we, we got this possibility 
to build something in the city of Augsburg for a summer festival. And they said, uh, you have six weeks <laughs> to, to finish the project and to get all of the, <laughs> the, the building permits and everything. So this was completely crazy. But uh, we actually, because the guys that paid for it with a very, very small budget, they, uh, the, it's a bank in the city and they had very good connections to the, to the mayor and so on. So they actually, they sped up the building permit process we had no chance. If we would have called them, they would have laughed at us and said, what? Forget it. But if uh, you need the right project partner that uh, can make this happen. And uh, so we actually, we managed to do this with uh, the six week timeline. We also made a model to really, um, yeah, put it in the office. <laughs> and yeah, here you see the process. We didn't produce it ourselves, so a friend who owns this company, they produced the parts and they also did some pre-assembly and uh, also on-site. I think one of these hexagons was pretty big and quite heavy. It's uh, 75 millimeter and um, 38 millimeter. So we made the two times 38 equivalent to the 75 and then every member is uh, equivalent cross-section. It's very, very much over dimension, but we were of course very scared, right? You have like a festival, there's a lot of people under it, there could be a thunderstorm and if this thing would collapse, uh, we would have been in big, big trouble. So uh, we needed to make it uh, super safe with the calculations and also we can't drill into the floor so we need to calculate the concrete slabs correctly we take need to take the right friction values on this uh, place very difficult to do this if you can't make a normal foundation that was one of the most challenging things but finally it was really <laughs> It was happening so until the last day it was very risky that it didn't happen because uh, we needed to have um, a, a second engineer check it that's if you do more um, advanced structures then you need to have two engineers one that does a report the second one who checks the report and both signatures basically and uh, we needed to do on-site uh, a load test to confirm the the calculations so building something like this is one challenge but then opening it to the public in the middle of the city very very serious thing so that was a big challenge and very scary but yeah finally um, it it was really uh, in the heart of the city and uh, nobody could miss it because the the, the trams go past it and so I think everybody has seen this weird timber thing <laughs> which was pretty pretty cool so yeah right now we are working on um, a different version which is uh, saddle shaped and maybe we can actually uh, finish it this year if we're lucky but you never know yeah like I told you it's like a one out of ten yeah. So 10 of these projects that we start, one gets built. Sometimes it might be more like one to 20. <laughs> well, it feels like one to 50. But yeah, every once in a while, um, you get one built. <laughs> so, thank you very much for your attention.